Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and joining me today is veteran co-host, mother, wife, doula, chiropractor, and so much more, Dr. Kristen Palacy. Welcome back. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. At home, you have tuned in to the before episode of a before and after two-part series, where we interview a pregnant person who is due to have a baby very soon, and then again after the birth to share their personal birth journey. Our very pregnant guest today is a passionate and professional doula, as well as a dedicated midwifery student. She has a background in prenatal yoga and has seen the ways in which a woman's emotions link directly to her physical being and believes that a peaceful mind is a peaceful body, and that leads to a graceful birth. And since you're having contractions, I'll keep that in mind. As a student midwife, she is currently studying at the National Midwifery Institute on her way to becoming a certified professional midwife and licensed midwife here in the state of California. She's also assisting in home births with her preceptor, midwife Alex Evangeliti, who is one of my favorite midwives to work with and is a guest on our podcast episode called Roadside Delivery. Catalina Clark, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you so much. Oh my goodness, it's such a, I always love talking to you, so now I'm glad I get to pick your brain a little bit more and um, share your journey with our audience. So what something that always strikes me is what causes somebody to become interested in birth work who doesn't have kids. I feel like a lot of people, when they go through the process, um, after that, they become interested in becoming a doula or a lactation specialist or a prenatal yoga teacher or midwife. Uh, how did you get started on this path? So I started as a doula in New York about four and a half years ago. I actually had an abortion and at that time in my life, I had no idea about anything about birth or pregnancy. And after my abortion, I started thinking, you know, what would I have done or what choices I would have made or what my options would have been. And I was working in nightlife, hospitality, restaurants, completely different lifestyle than I have now. And I thought back to what I always wanted to be when I grew up, which was a nurse. So that's what initially led me down the path of becoming a midwife. But before I decided to go to midwifery school, I wanted to attend births. So I became a doula in order to get the experience I needed to make sure that midwifery would be the right fit for me. Well, that seems smart. So like dipping your toes in the water. Yeah, exactly. See how you like it. How was uh, doula training and starting to go to births for you? It was great. It was different than my experience now. I started off in New York City attending only hospital births, not for any particular reason other than those were the only births that I had the opportunity to attend at that time. Mm -hmm. And I used to think I wanted to become a nurse midwife and I was going to go to nursing school in New York. But after attending so many hospital births, I started to get a little bit disheartened by the system and realized that you can't practice midwifery. I couldn't practice midwifery in the way that I wanted to in a hospital system, which is what led me to moving back to California to learn from professional midwives and traditional licensed midwives. So can you talk a little bit about the difference between those two types of training? Sure. So nurse midwifery is a traditional higher education program. Basically, you get your bachelor's in nursing, and then you get your master's in midwifery. For somebody who's already a nurse, it might make a lot more sense to go ahead and become a nurse midwife. Mm -hmm. But for me, the problem I had with it was I knew I wanted to do home births, but all the training was based in the hospital. So I would be coming out of a nursing midwifery program, very skilled, but not with the skills I needed to be a home birth midwife. Mm -hmm. And are they very different skills? They are different skills, I think. I think at the core, midwifery really has nothing to do with nursing whatsoever. So there's a lot of things that you learn in nursing school that you will never actually use as a midwife. Mm -hmm. That said, there are benefits that nurses are better at certain things like putting in IVs just because they've done them so, so many. many times yeah. and we don't do them as often at home. But I think to be comfortable in the home setting where you don't have everything at your fingertips in an emergency situation, having those skills by being trained at home is really what 
I think is the most important thing about training to be a home birth midwife. I mean, birth looks dramatically different in the hospital versus out of the hospital. So it makes sense to me that even though there are midwives who practice in the hospital and midwives who practice at home, that the skill sets are just very different. And that's not to say that there aren't amazing home birth nurse midwives who have had many years of experience both at home in birth centers and in hospitals. But for someone like me who Starting is out. making a career change halfway you know, through my 20s, I felt like I wanted to fast track my road to becoming a, a home birth Although midwife. Although I've never met a bartending <laughs> midwife, so you could actually, that could be your name. That niche. could be a new thing. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Um, I have a question. Shoot. Um, so is the birth kind of culture in New York much different than it is Ooh, here? That's a good um, question. And is that why you were thinking of coming to California or what made you change? It is different. Most, although I don't have, I can't speak to the home birth community in New York because I never had that experience. From But from what I do know is that most of the home birth midwives in New York were also nurse midwives. It's sort of the standard of care that home birth midwives are nurse midwives in New York. In New York. In New York. In New York. They just happen to be. It's not even a legal thing where in some states there are different laws that you have to be a certain, have a certain licensure in order to practice home midwifery. Right. Um, But it's just the way things are there in New York, at least in New York City where I was living. So I felt like coming to California, which is kind of the land of home birth midwifery, and while there are a lot of laws and regulations of what we can and cannot do, it's sort of the best option. For education in terms of what you wanted to exactly. do. Exactly. Got it. Yeah, the scope in California for midwifery was narrowed just a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there are neighboring states where you can do more than exactly. you can here. When did uh, prenatal yoga come into the mix? So during that transition time where I had just had an abortion, I was very unhappy in my current job, super unfulfilled. I started a yoga teacher training, not because I wanted to become a yoga teacher, but just as a transition of what I wanted to do. And during that time, I also did my birth doula training and prenatal yoga teacher training as well. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of this intermediate phase. And I did teach yoga and I did teach prenatal yoga in New York for about two years. Were you, were you doing yoga before this, before this, any of this happened? Yeah, I've done yoga my You're... whole life. I've actually had six knee surgeries. And so that led me to using yoga to re- rehabilitate myself after my partial knee replacement. Wow. Do you get a discount uh, after like four or five? <laughs> I no. wish. No? A little value pack. <clears throat> oh, so you're like the yoga type. Yes. Absolutely. And unfortunately, I don't have time to teach prenatal yoga anymore, but it's something now, right? But it's something that I incorporate with my clients. Yeah. And and you're still doing yoga. And I practice myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, All right. So when you move to LA and you start doing midwifery training, what's the training program like? So... I actually started at one school and transferred. There's a couple different options. There's only one school where you can go and physically sit in a classroom. And I thought that that's what I needed to be held accountable. Um, But then I had to drive to San Diego for that school. (laughs) For, oh, to, to, I mean, you would have to live there or is it like a series of? No, I just drive once a week to take class. Okay. Um, So I transitioned to an online school And the way it works, and the bulk of your education is through your preceptor. So you mentioned Alex earlier, and she is basically my mentor, teacher. She is helping me to gain the skills that I need to become a midwife. There's two different things. There's didactic knowledge of anatomy, physiology, things like that, and pathology. But then there's there's also the skills of being able to attend birth and... Right. So the academic portion is skills. done online. So uh, reading books, writing? Reading, writing. Testing. All of the above. And then once you finish both your practical skills and your academic homework portion, then you sit and take a test run by the state medical board. 
And once you pass that test, you're eligible to get your license. So what are some of the practical skills that you would learn from apprenticing? So the skills that you learn in a preceptorship begin prenatally. So taking care of pregnant women from as early as the first trimester. I guess I should say that it actually even begins with well women care. So midwives do pap smears, yearly visits, birth control options, everything like that, natural family planning, and then prenatal care, which includes regular visits, just like somebody would go and see their OB, monitoring the wellness of the mother and baby, and then birth skills, which include how to, it's really more about just watching and learning and observing rather than physical skills. I often say, and a lot of midwives say, that birth is not rocket science. Mm -hmm. So learning to be patient and watchful and learning what things what to look out for and what's normal. But there are practical normal. skills like draw, drawing blood, oh, starting sure. an IV, checking a cervix, doing a pap smear. Yeah, vitals, um, yeah, blood vital pressure, signs. sure. And and uh, even interventions that you would do at home if needed. Exactly. Um, so all of that is just, you don't learn that in a group setting, you learn that one-on-one with your midwife? Exactly. So your midwife says, here, we're going to learn how to check a cervix, and she just one of your patients volunteers? Yeah. Sweet. Exactly. Mm-hmm. There are there are skills workshops that mm-hmm. people can go to and learn. Suturing, for example, is a great skill that we need to learn, and it's great to learn it from someone like an OB, like Dr. Stuart Fishbein, might hold a workshop and teach midwives how to suture. I saw a picture on Facebook of a bunch of midwives suturing chicken breasts. Yeah, exactly. And I, and <laughs> or cow was, tongues. Or cow, yeah, cow, I mean, cow tongue is more. It's it feels and looks. And has the texture of a vagina and perineum more than chicken. Good to know. Yeah. <laughs> I never would have guessed. You'll never look at tongue the same. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> so um, so that's, that's, uh, that's great that you get to learn that way. And also with other people must make it more interesting. Yeah, I think it's a really great practical way to learn. It's definitely the way that I learn the most. So the idea of sitting in a classroom and going through a traditional academic program like a bachelor's and a master's program where you don't get that hands-on experience until the very end in your last couple years, like kind of similar to say like residency or interning Mm -hmm. as, you know, if you could apply it to pre-med or something like that. Um, That's the way that I learn. And I think most midwives are very hands-on people. That's why we're midwives. We touch bellies. Carpenter too. Yeah. These are our hands are our ultrasound. Kairos means hands. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, at the end of your training, then your preceptor certifies basically that you're proficient in these skills. Exactly. And then your didactic testing, you have tests for, and then you're ready to roll. And then you have to study for the test. For the national exam. Exactly. Well, it's run by the state. Each state has slightly different licensures. Oh, really? So if you move from state to state, you have to get licensed. There's reciprocity in, I think it's Florida and Washington and Oregon. You can practice with a license from California, but other states are different. Is there a national nurse midwife exam? There is. Oh, okay. So they can move around. They can practice legally in all 50 states. Wow. Okay. So there's a distinction for someone looking to become a midwife if you Mm -hmm. like to travel. My wife has this as a psychologist. She has a lot of her patients uh, move or, move around because they're either in entertainment or other fields where they're traveling. And sometimes she'll be doing couples counseling where the two partners are in different states or mm-hmm. sometimes even different countries. And she's here and they're all get, gathered together in a secure chat room. But the law is she has to be licensed in the state where they are, not the state where she is. Wow. So she's picking up all these like provisional licenses and and licenses in other states. I mean, it's soon she'll she's like a boy scout with all those little badges. All the merit badges. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you now have served two different roles, and you're going to serve a third role soon, which is the role of doula mm-hmm. at a birth the role of midwife assistant at a birth and soon to be midwife at a birth. What is the difference in your mind between the role of doula and midwife or midwife assistant? So a midwife is a medical care provider. A doula is not. A doula is emotional, informational, physical support and touch. As a medical care provider, 
we and as a midwife, we are there to provide very compassionate care. However, we also are there to monitor the safety of mom and baby. And mm-hmm. sometimes that becomes more, even more important than sure. that emotional care that we're giving. Well, they go really well together. I right. mean, you, you get both. They're, they really seem like two pieces of a puzzle that when you have both, make for the most supported birth. Um, I, I've been to lots of home birth, lots of out, uh, out of hospital, both in a birthing center or at home. And um, watching midwives work is just, it's amazing. It's really, I, I am so inspired by them. And I've said many times before, and I'll say it again, I do not have the balls to be a midwife. Um, I don't think I could ever do it. It's so much responsibility. You know, I can support in that emotional way. I can support physically just with what I do, like body work and touch. But having that responsibility and and really, you know, being able to keep your finger on the pulse of everything and make sure that mom is safe and baby is safe. And also they tend to take other people under their wing, too, like the partner, making sure the partner is safe and other people on the birth team. It's really a tremendous amount of responsibility. And they do it so well. And and um, it's inspiring. It's really inspiring. And it's very different than the role of doula. What about midwife assistant, that sort of in between? I think. The role of the midwife assistant is really to practice being the midwife. Mm -hmm. So I do know some midwife assistants who also can and will step into the role of a doula. And I think midwives also step into the role of the doula in in births as well. But I don't see the role of a midwife's assistant being that much different than the role of the midwife. Um, As an assistant myself, I try to put myself in the role of a midwife. Mm -hmm. So we might not, especially in the beginning when you're first getting started and you're first building relationships with clients, it's mostly about building trust and confidence in your skills so that those clients will then see you as equal with your midwife, trust you, and allow you to start doing things like vaginal exams, catching their babies, catching their placentas, things like that. Do you, do you find yourself at the beginning questioning yourself about things? Like, is this really what I think it is or is this not really? No, I think it's more about just confidence and about seeing. Does that come with re- repetition? The more you do Absolutely. it, the, the, the easier it gets. Is it different attending birth now that you're pregnant? Because you've been doing a lot of births during your pregnancy. I didn't feel a big difference being pregnant at births, really. I think stopping at 34 weeks, maybe I stopped sooner, 32 or 33 weeks. I think you tried to, but then you got (laughs) called back in. Yeah, I went to one last birth, which was a really great last birth to go to. I think physically on my body, sure, it was more taxing and I was more tired and there was more aches and pains, but, and I felt, I did feel a connection to our clients a lot more as a pregnant person. And I have a lot of respect for, I feel like I always had empathy for what pregnant women felt and went through. But I think going through it yourself, you you really have a whole new level of respect. That makes sense. I think I have em- empathy too. And I also realize that I'll never, uh, you know, have that level of understanding. Right. As far as I can tell. All right. And on that note, (laughs) uh, let's take a little commercial break and we're going to come right back with Catalina Clark on the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. (laughs) Check out the Doing It at Home podcast hosted by Matthew and Sarah Bivens. It's a show dedicated to empowering stories and resources around home birth. Matthew and Sarah started the show as a way to document their own pregnancy and birth journey when 18 weeks into the pregnancy, they made the switch to a home birth plan with midwives. Each week, they interview other home birth moms and families to hear their birth stories, as well as experts in topics ranging from breastfeeding, sex, postpartum care, doulas, birth photography, and much, much more. They also continue to share their own reflections on their birth experience, future family planning, and navigating the world of parenting together. The Doing It at Home podcast aims to normalize home birth and to encourage mamas and families to be educated, supported, and empowered by their birth choices, whatever they are. You can find the Doing It at Home podcast in Apple Podcasts, Google Play, the Pod Network, Stitcher, and on their website, www. Dot D-I-A-H podcast dot com.
Yeah. Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, here with co-host Dr. Kristen Palacy, and we're continuing our discussion with prenatal yogi doula midwife student and almost mom, Catalina Clark. Welcome back. So um, before I was asking you, before the little break, I was, I was wondering what it's like to attend birth now that you're pregnant. What's it like to receive prenatal care um, instead of giving it? It's been a really interesting experience. I feel like it's very non-traditional in any way at all, even if midwifery might seem non-traditional to a lot of people. But the way that I've gone about receiving prenatal care has also been, I've customized it to myself. How do you mean? When it comes to how often I wanted to see my midwives or what tests I did and didn't want to do. That was a big deal for me. For example, glucose test, very common test that a lot of people really don't want to do, right? You have to drink this disgusting sugar drink. And people feel like they can't, they have no other option. They have to do it. Their doctor said you have to drink this drink and take this test. It's standard. And I think it's important for people to know that you do have options. And then not just because I'm a midwife and I have the information, everybody has the option to decline anything or to come up with their own glucose test. Ask for alternatives or, yeah. Exactly. So what I did was I took my own blood sugars with a glucometer for Mm -hmm. a week fasting and two hours after eating, recorded it, brought it to my midwives and said, look, I have no signs of diabetes or prediabetes. And we use that as a reference for not having gestational diabetes. Mm, So you're you're a much more active player in your prenatal care than probably most people would be. I think so, but I don't know if it's that most people would be or because most people don't think they have a choice. Well, 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 I would say then most people are. And one of the reasons they may not be is because they don't know that they have a choice. Um, And also, I think a lot of people like to, you know, since you go to midwifery school for a long time or medical school for a long time, a lot of people like to place their trust in their providers and say, look, you know what's best for me. What should I do? um, And there's everything in between. Some people want to be on top of every decision. Some people want you to make all the decisions for them. And there's everything in between. I think generally speaking, uh, in today's world, it's the way medicine is. All healthcare providers have a lot weighing on them in addition to what's in your best interest. There's, um, you know, what's insurance going to pay for or not pay for, what's going to have higher or less liability, Liability what's going to take me more or less time. And so, you know, as human beings, those things all go through the mind of a practitioner, but all you really care about is what's in your best interest. So I think more than ever, it's important to become educated and informed and and an active part of your decision making, even if you leave the ultimate decision up to your provider. Um, so surely, with all the births you've attended, you've seen lots of different things, births that go quicker and slower, births that are um, easier or more challenging. Um, do those weigh on you at all? As you're, I mean, you're getting close to your own birth now. I think the good outweigh the bad. And I don't want to say that there's any there's such thing as a bad birth, but there are longer, harder, more difficult births than others. But... It doesn't scare me because in the end, I know that all of those clients who had the longer, harder, more difficult births all came out of those births feeling victorious and empowered because of the care that they had Mm -hmm. with our team. And even if it ended in a transfer, even if it ended in a cesarean, I know that she knows, the birthing person knows that they did everything that they could to have the best birth experience possible. Have you learned anything either positive or negative from somebody else's birth experience that you'll, you think you'll take into your birth experience? Something that you were like, oh, I want to try that, or hmm, that didn't look like it went over too well? I can't think of anything, one thing particularly. And, you know, I think, for example, like I don't have a birth plan of these are the things I want to do and these are the things I don't want to do. Well, how, that's going to ruin my next question. <laughs> that was my Sorry. question. <laughs> like, well, how are you? How do you want to birth? I, I have a plan. 
I just don't have a, something written down. I have my preferences, which mm-hmm. is what I always like to refer to birth plans are. Um, as what are a, your preferences? Well, I think when you're birthing at home, you don't have to write a list of these things. They're kind of they're all given. Everything that you want to have in a birth, which is to not be induced, to be uninterrupted, to not have interventions, to not have antibiotics, to keep the lights dim, and all of these things that we write on our hospital birth plans are all it's it's written into the care of working with a midwife. So and you're automatically on the same page on most of those things, exactly. or you wouldn't be having your baby at home. Exactly. Um, are there things that you're doing to get your body ready for birth? Um, yes, I have been doing since the first trimester monthly chiropractic. I highly recommend it. It's, uh... <laughs> Acupuncture, massage. I didn't do as much yoga in the first trimester as I would have liked, but I didn't beat myself up too hard about that. Did you have first trimester symptoms? I was sick for two weeks, Hmm. but other than that, I just was very tired Mm -hmm. and not, I didn't feel like I had the energy to do yoga and I was also really busy. Yeah. I mean, that seems smart to listen to your body. Yeah. So I started probably around the beginning of the second trimester and have continued through now. And I think I felt really great throughout my pregnancy and I really wanted to practiced what I preached when it came to taking care of myself. And I think between the chiropractic massage and acupuncture once a month, that it's really helped maintain my me through the pregnancy. Do you do them on different weeks? So like yeah. every week there's something? Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. What's your ideal frequency for yoga, prenatal yoga? I'm only there once or twice a week mm-hmm. at this point. That's funny that you say only. <laughs> I'm doing yoga maybe three or four times a year. I was (laughs) doing, I was going to regular classes and modifying them. So I was going to up to three to four classes a week. Well, that makes a lot of prenatal yoga is fluffy and you're, you're a yogi. So that seems like it would be too easy for you. Yeah. We have great, there's great prenatal yoga teachers in LA though, who really know how to help prepare. Sure. But those, I mean, there's not a lot to choose from. So you know, if you're going to have to work with your schedule, then it makes sense to me that you would rather go to a regular class and modify than a fluffy class. Yes, for sure. I just like saying fluffy, actually. <laughs> it's fun. Say fluffy. Fluffy. See? Yeah. And okay. it's right down the street from my house, so I could walk. Oh, that's nice. Oh, that's nice. really nice. Oh, convenient. <laughs> so that's your body. What about your mind? What are you doing to get your mind ready? First of all, do you take a class with everything you already know? I did. I did take a class. I took... Was that mostly for you or your partner or both? It was for both of us. I I really wanted to feel like... Sometimes I wanted to feel like I was just a regular pregnant person and not a doula midwife pregnant person. And we took a class that's based on home birthing and with other couples who were also home birthing. Ooh, that's nice. That's cool. And so it was a great way to meet other people in the community and also help my partner feel like he was more on a level playing field. Was he on board with home birth right away? Yes. Okay. Was that a requisite to be a part of your life or? No, but he's always been on board and he's, we've been together since I've gone through this transition. Oh, okay. We met when I, back when I was in my yoga teacher training oh, wow. before I did my first doula training. Oh, so wow. he's seen this whole transition. What do you see his role as at your birth? I see his role as being my primary support person. I'm really fortunate enough to have many doulas in my life who I would be able to call in labor if I need them. But I have such a big team of midwives that I'm hoping for my husband to be that person for me. That's beautiful. That is really nice. And he's he's like up for the role. Yeah. Yeah. I but, think he'll rise to the occasion. That's really great. Did you? Did he read any books? He didn't read any books. It's just not his thing. Like I couldn't get him to do it, and I didn't want to force him to do it. Sure. So taking a class, watching documentaries, watching YouTube videos, talking to the midwives, 
things like that. If there was a book, which one would you have recommended? I recommend The Birth Partner. I think that's a good one for partners. I think so, too. Great book. So, and then your mind. I know I cut myself off. Are there other things you're doing for mind prep? I should be meditating more, but I'm not. I keep telling myself that I should be doing that more. Is that not part of yoga? You do it separately? Yeah, it is a part of it. But I don't have I don't have a good daily meditation practice where I sit down every morning for five minutes or however long. And I do think that that's something that would be really helpful, especially helpful towards the end of pregnancy where you're anxious and waiting. And even I can't escape counting down the days till my due date, even though I know the due date means nothing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's good to know that that everybody, literally everybody, feels that as you get closer. I have done certain things to help me stay out of my head in general. Like I didn't share my due date with family or friends. Mm-hmm. I just said it was in July, and that helped. I also didn't weigh myself. I haven't weighed myself this pregnancy, oh. which is probably the most empowering that's so part nice. of this entire experience. Mm. I don't know my pre-pregnancy weight. I haven't weighed myself. So I have no expectation. OMG, I'm going to start doing that. Let me write that down. <laughs> Don't weigh yourself. That's what I'm most excited about, This that I made it through the whole pregnancy without weighing myself. That's really great. That's really nice. Where, When your mind runs away, where does it go? I'm a little bit OCD about like things being organized. And so that's where my mind goes. It's like if things aren't organized, I can't relax. Mm -hmm. So the thought of the baby coming and the dishes aren't done or the laundry is not done. Oh, wow. I know. I wonder if that'll change once the baby comes. That's my my practice. My challenge is to let go. I do have like several OCD, uh, varying degrees of OCD patients who say that it, it, for the most, if it's not extreme, it's mild. It actually it uh, gets resolved pretty quickly once the baby comes. So there's that. Um, <laughs> how are you getting your home ready? I mean, I guess you're doing the dishes and stuff. But <laughs> yep, we're we're pretty organized. We don't have a nursery. We're planning to co sleep, co bed, co habitate with co-family. the baby, <laughs> co family. So I don't I don't feel the need to have all the baby things and the nursery and. That sort of stuff handled. We live in a small place with three dogs, mm-hmm. so oh, now you'll be a <laughs> one a one to one ratio, human to uh, dog. Human to dog, exactly. So go team human. Preparing for home birth is not as difficult as it may seem. We really need very simple supplies, um, and most of the things you can find laying around your house. And the birth team brings the rest of the medical equipment. Are you a water person? I was going to ask that question. Oh, I I am. Are you a water person? I am a water person. Do you want to labor in water, birth in water, all the above? I would love to. I would really love to. But I'm also not attached to the idea that I have to have a water birth. No, but I mean, do you like baths in general? I do. Do you find them calming? I do. I don't fit in the bathtub anymore. Are they going to bring an inflatable (laughs) tub? Yes, exactly. Mm. I wish that I had access to an inflatable tub. During your labor? Yeah, because it was only like a very structured mm-hmm. tub. And since I had back labor, I really wanted to go forward and then I couldn't. So I just think those inflatable tubs are... Oh, you mean you're like you weren't fully submerged in it? I, I was submerged, but in a structured bathtub. You couldn't move around? Yeah, I, I had no like give back from the air th- oh. from the inflatable tub, which I think would have felt nice. Hmm. Yeah, so. they're great because you can lean over the edges yeah. and even have handles on the sides so that you can, can grab onto. People can get in there with you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, too many people, <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, what do you, aside from water, what, what do you think will be comfort measures that will be helpful for you during labor? I think breathing is really the most important comfort measure for anybody. Um, It seems to be the thing that can calm someone down, or at least for me, when I have aches and pains, just breathing, breathing through them. Um, I have all the things. I have the birth ball and the peanut ball, and I have a TENS unit. Mm. I have... Smart. Yeah, unless you're in the bath, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that would be interesting. Do you, are you a music person? Do you have like a music playlist? Yeah, me and my that? husband have our wedding 
playlists that are very long because we didn't have a DJ or anything. So we had multiple playlists. So just planning to use that. I'm kind of like less is more person. Mm -hmm. So I think, and I think especially when it comes to birth, it's good to have all these little tricks and things in your back pocket. But at the end of the day, everything we really need to give birth, we have inside ourselves and we don't really need all of these extra things. Do you, I mean, having been to a lot of home births, I sometimes am really wowed by the food um, that people get. Are you, have you thought about how you're going to feed your birth team? I haven't. Okay. But. That might just be more important to me than other people. <laughs> I know that it is important, but our our fridge is always stocked. We're also vegan mm. and gluten free oh, wow. and soy free. And, oh, so you don't need You know, any. all the things. So, um, <laughs> yeah. But. It's just a tree in the backyard. And yeah. all the things. I like how she put that. There are lots of snacks, though, for. Absolutely. So many more now than five to 10 years exactly. ago. Exactly. So at least there's some yummy things. Um, I know you said you're not married to certain things, but I always wonder, like, how flexible are you in your plan? Like if for some reason you did have to go down that flow chart, how comfortable are you with that? And also did you set up a specific backup obstetrician and hospital if you would need to transfer? If I had to go down another road, I think I would be open to it only because I would know that I was going there for the most legitimate reason versus going in for an induction because I'm past a certain date that my care provider doesn't feel comfortable with or because my care provider is going out of town or because my fluid is low and they want me to induce or something of that nature. Um, I feel confident in my team and also in myself too make that decision if it's necessary. And if we were to have to go to a hospital setting, we have a backup physician who is willing to support us. Backup is also one of those words in birth that we don't really like to use because there is really no official obstetricians, unfortunately, who back up midwives. And I put backup in Air quotes. Air quotes. You can't see him, but I promise she's doing it. Yeah, because it's not legally, but hospitals don't like it, and insurance companies don't like it. And so there's no one on record who will say, yes, I support midwives, and if you're at home and you have a problem, please come to us and we will help you. Mm -hmm. We have to sort of go underground and text the cool docs that we know and say, like, hey, will you help us out? We have a mom in labor, and she needs, she needs an transfer. epidural, or mm. she needs Pitocin or something. Wow. But you have someone specific in mind that you would yes. that you would reach out to. Her underground doc. Yeah. We can't like obviously that. reveal that here today. <laughs> there will be no more underground doctor. <clears throat> um, how about afterbirth? Have you thought about um, afterbirth and done I anything to plan for that? about postpartum. You don't hear that a lot. It was really important to me to prepare for postpartum equally as much as for birth. So we have a postpartum doula who will help us in the first 40 days. I have set up the house and made lists of grocery lists and chores and to-do lists and things for my husband and people who are coming over to help us. We've mm -hmm. also set very clear boundaries with our family and friends about not having visitors over in the first days or weeks until we're ready. Well, that's really nice. Uh, we set up a meal train. Did they take it well? Some of them did and okay. some of them yeah. did not. That makes sense. But I feel very confident in being able to say no or to limit visits to 15 to 20 minutes and you better be bringing food or <laughs> put in the laundry. That's what I say. We don't that even have a baby. Uh -huh. Awesome. Well, mm. any final questions or thoughts? I mean, you shared a lot. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Yeah. It's it's kind of neat to get into your head because, again, you've seen so much and you've attended a lot of birth and you've been driven and passionate about this field. Um, you sort of were driven away from New York by what you saw there and how things were going down there. And um, you work with one of the coolest midwives ever and i um, jealous every time you come in to the office <laughs> after a super long birth, a little tired and achy. I'm like, oh, man, that must have been cool. <laughs> I'm excited to see how you feel after, too, and if it changed your perspective in any way. Me, too. I'm very curious about labor. I'm feeling contractions already, but none that hurt, and I, I want them to hurt. I'm like, I want to know what it feels Inside. like. I'm so curious. Um, I'm just trying to stay curious and not get too anxious. Do you have a thought on what it'll feel like? I have no idea. No idea. And I don't even want to try to act like... Formulate it. <laughs> I know. Even though I've seen it so many times, I just think that you can't. There's no way to know until you actually go through it yourself. I think I know. <laughs> what if it, why is that? Because one day we had leftover Chinese food... <laughs> And we had leftover Mexican food, but not enough of either one to make a full meal. Oh, no. So I mixed them together, and I didn't realize they were quite as old as they were. And I ate them and went to bed. And I woke up at around 1 o'clock in the morning, and I swear to you, I was having contractions every five minutes, <laughs> lasting about a minute apiece. I Sounds texted my doula painful. to see if she was awake. Yeah. I mean, I think if you want, try <laughs> if you try the um, sort of two-day-old Kung Pao enchiladas, it's a good way to do a test run. So you could feel what you think. I but. think I'll pass. I think it's the closest I could ever come. I mean, so probably. I'm sort of grateful for that experience. Yeah. But that's all I get because um, <laughs> I don't have really? any cow tongue in the house. All right. That's all I got. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Where can we find you online? I am on Instagram at Catalina.Clerk. And... Um, how much longer to your to your midwife training is over, roughly? It's not an exact science. Well, my goal is to finish in about six months from now. Oh, and you think you will? I hope so. It's and possible. then you have to take the, including the exam? No. So I would sign up for the exam in six months, but I would be finished with my preceptorship and my academics. Oh, amazing. Mm -hmm. Watch out, world. Here she comes. <laughs> all right. Uh, can't wait to have you back on the other side and see how it all goes. We're obviously sending you lots of positive birth vibes, and um, I'm excited for you. Down, I'm probably down on, like the last one on your list of doulas you can call on if you need some big Thank you. hands uh, squeezing your hips together. <laughs> Kristen, thanks for joining us. Oh, it's been a while. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It's nice to have you back, doctor. It's really great to be here. Now that you finished uh, all your training yeah. and got all licensed and legitimate and everything. Seriously. When I started, I was his intern. Oh, wow. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, thanks. which means I should be retiring soon. <laughs> At home, thanks for listening to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. Please take a moment to rate us in your podcast app and share any feedback you have, either in the app or send us an email at informedpregnancy.com. I got a whole lot of questions for you This kid's gonna test my will I got a lot to learn and my baby's too <laughs> This podcast is a proud member of Parents on Demand, a network of high-quality shows for families just like yours. Download our free network app on Apple and Android and listen to your favorite episodes on the go.